I was looking online the other day and I saw some people posting about the Nexus. I think somebody had even asked me a question relating to the Nexus and going back uh, into that period of time. And it dawned on me. I said, holy crap, that happened back in 2010. 2010, like to give you scope on just how long ago that was, that was back in my days, I was living in Iowa and we haven't even started the old Off the Rope Show channel yet. Like, that's how far back you're talking with 2010, because it was December 6th of that year that we did our first ever video. Um, 10 years ago, today, August 15th, 10 years ago, today, was SummerSlam 2010. As so many of us have come to affectionately know it as the day the Nexus died. R.I.P., even though it persisted and continued and even had a new nexus and all this other, for all intents and purposes, this was the date, 10 years ago today, that the nexus died. It was buried, it was ruined, and there was absolutely no resuscitation from the disastrous booking decision that happened. That's a long time ago. Like, if you look back at what happened with the Nexus, starting, I think it was in June of 2010, and these eight young guys from FCW came on the scene, or excuse me, well, NXT, FCW, you get what I'm saying. Like, that's how long ago it is that the, even fact, the mere fact that I'm invoking FCW, invoking NXT season one, like, that's how far back in time we go. Johnny Ace was the director of talent relations for WWE. That's how far back this thing goes. And when those eight guys hit the scene that first night and they destroyed Cena, they destroyed the ring, Daniel Bryan's choking, what was it, Justin Roberts with his top. <laughs> now you're thinking to yourself, holy crap. Like, what are they doing here? Like, this feels like something. This is a great opportunity, this is a great platform. And based off of the way these guys were booked kind of from Jump Street, at least initially, you were assuming that you were potentially going to get a few big time stars out of this, at least a few main event guys. And some of these other guys would find their roles within the roster. Like you were looking, based off of who debuted in that first night, you were looking at eight guys and you say, all of them in some way, shape or form have some type of future, some at the very top, some at the middle, and some will be kind of underneath guys. But it was kind of an exciting thing. You got the rookies running amok at a time where the company really needed some fresh blood. Oh my God, we're still saying that in 2020. They needed some fresh blood. They needed some new stars because Force and Sheamus down everybody's throat wasn't getting the job done. And we needed something else. We needed something more. Having Zack Swagger win Money in the Bank wasn't getting the job done. And you think about going back to 2010 and what it ultimately ended up being with Linda McMahon's first failed Senate campaign. Hey, Keep your eyes on the business and make more money here or waste $50 million of your own money to lose to then come back in two years from then and do the exact same thing again. Like That's how far back in time we're going here. But, you know, even once what happened on the first night and Daniel Bryan was fired because of what he did during the attack and the strangulation, this is a couple of years on the heels of what Chris Benoit did to Nancy and Daniel. Uh, you, you look at this and you say... Oh, even that, like, admittedly, back then, a decade ago, again, a long time ago, like, Daniel Bryan was plain as hell. He was plain as crap. And you can go back and look at him at 2010. Yet all the people on the internet, all the ROH fans, all the New Japan fans, all of these guys, talking about how great he was and how much of a star he was and how awesome he was and what a great professional wrestler he was and all of that. And you see this, dude, and he was just like the epitome of plain Jane, so to speak. It was ironic that Miz was his coach and da 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 da, like great dynamics. And still to this day, the dynamics to be with those guys, you can always put those two in a rivalry, you know, and it will work for me. But even when you look at it, here's Wade Barrett. Now, here's a guy you look at him and you say, he's got great size, he can talk, he's at least serviceable in the ring. He's the type of guy that. 
has enough of it, you felt like, that he's the main event player. He's going to be one of those dudes. And not only that, importantly enough, going to be one of those dudes that the company, and Vince McMahon especially, will get behind enough that he will become a star for them. He will become a main event player for them. We're looking at the future for the next decade. Now you had Skip Sheffield, and you could see like, hey, the gimmick is dumb. But again, another dude got that size. Like a couple of years later, he's Ryback, and you know, then that ultimately didn't happen like it should have. Like, but you looked at some of these guys, and you saw Justin Gabriel, and you say, okay, he kind of fits this type of high flying mold, and there's certainly a place for that in the company. So he could certainly have a role. Like Michael Tarver just kind of reeked an it oozed intensity and physicality, kind of a, a legitness to him. That doesn't necessarily mean that he would be a main event player, but certainly felt like he was a guy that, again, was going to have a place somewhere middle in the card, somebody that could potentially do some good business with WWE. And then, of course, you've got the Heath Slaters of the worlds and the so-ons and so forth. I just looking at that group, you know, you looked at them and you said, okay, not all these guys are going to be main event players, but I sure as hell would have put money on Wade Barrett being a main event player. I sure as hell would have put money on Skip Sheffield being a main event player. I sure as heck would have put money on somebody like Michael Tarver or Justin Gabriel, at least getting to a certain point in the company, not all the way, but again, not everybody needs to be a top guy main eventer in order to be a star or to make some money for the company. You know, then you had David Otungan, whatever that's supposed to be. You know, but you know, here was a guy that you said, good looking dude, you know, somewhat put together, a little bit on a small side, you know, wrestling doesn't really feel like his jam. Like somewhere from a personality standpoint, you probably would find something and somewhere at some point where he could be heelish and it would kind of work. But the, the bottom line is, is you get to all of this and they have been running roughshod over the company in the locker room, you know, to the point where they're having the world champ Sheamus running for the Nexus and going and saying, guys, help me. These guys are coming after me. We've got to unite and get together. Immediately chopping the balls off of Sheamus all those years ago. So now... We get to SummerSlam 2010, and it's going to be the seven guys from Nexus versus the seven guys from Team WWE, and in this case, Team Cena. Let's keep it real here. And that's what we were looking at. The big reveal, of course, that night was who was going to be the last member of Team WWE, and it, of course, was Daniel Bryan. And, like, to me, that was an interesting plot twist. That was an interesting, you know, kind of secondary story there. The guy who was part of the group that got fired, now he's back and he's on the other side. And you're like, well, okay, that's interesting. So we're going to make this a Daniel Bryan showcase. Now, you're talking about here for the Nexus. They get to SummerSlam. It's a big four pay-per-view. Not only a big four pay-per-view, their first real true opportunity at a major pay-per-view to do something, to make a statement to show out, to show out well. So you're thinking, okay, you've got Edge, you've got Jericho in this. They understand, they know business, and they understand what good business is here. And there's no way in hell that they're going to be the ones that ultimately win. And you would have to think that they're going to have enough experience, enough influence, enough sway here at least with the powers that be, and especially most certainly John Cena to where they could sway him to say the Nexus has to go over here. The Nexus needs to go over here. And we all know what happened. When we say this was the day that the Nexus died, it truly was. When I talk about the decade of doom that was the reign of Cena in WWE, this was like peak height breakfast club BS that there ever was. Now, sure, you could sit there and say for, like, Wade Barrett, it wasn't truly the end for him, you know, because he had a couple of other pay-per-views and he did other business with Cena throughout the course of 2010. Remember, the Cena got fired. He's going to be one Cena, and he's coming into, like, God. When you think back about 2010, like, I've tried to subconsciously Remove this crap from my memory banks because that's how bad it was. That's how much of a disaster it was. And the whole time I'm sitting there watching it 
And I'm saying to myself, you know what? This is exactly the type of crap you would expect from Cena. This is exactly the type of self-serving, undercutting others type of business that you would see from him that would go largely unchecked from WWE in order for him to selfishly protect and maintain his spot. And then admittedly, when you're in that perspective, you've been there for so many years and you're given so many opportunities and you're given so much power, it can be hard to remove your head from your own ass and be able to see the bigger picture. And I know Cena has been asked about this in recent years. I know Edge and Jericho have certainly talked about the fact that Cena was dead set against it, that they were dead set against the Nexus losing and John had his own idea and they're like, this is terrible because it was terrible because they knew what the hell they were talking about. It's what frustrates me so much when people say, well, Cena didn't have that much power. You really think so? When you are truly a top guy in WWE, you have a tremendous amount of sway. You have a tremendous amount of power and influence over what you are involved in, how it plays out, and what ultimately happens and who goes over. A ton of it. You should talk about Hogan not putting people over. Talk about Austin, you talk about Brett and Sean and all these other people. But magically, somehow, some way, all these other people that we've talked about legitimately and deservedly, all being selfish and at times not doing the best thing for business, now magically, all of a sudden, the Breakfast Club has influenced so many of you to think magically that all these previous decades of precedent don't freaking matter. The hell is wrong with you? And Cena's saying, well, you're not. you did too, you jerk. Like, instead of being... You know, a real professional and a real man and admitting your mistake and saying, you know what? That's one of the stupidest decisions I ever made. It was one of the stupidest things I was ever involved in. I take full responsibility. I screwed it up. What happens now, of course, is since it doesn't matter to see and he doesn't give a crap, now he's putting people over. All of a sudden, the people that grew up with him as little kids that think he was some hero, all of a sudden, hey, wait, wait, look, this is great. Look at who he's putting over when it doesn't freaking matter and it doesn't have the same type of impact. And even back in the day when Cena would put somebody over, it almost always was some type of hook or crook BS. Like, you look at other sports, even the best of the best have bad days and sometimes... They just lose. And that's okay. It doesn't diminish their greatness. If anything, it can make you appreciate their greatness even more. So when you sit there and you get to this moment where it is so freaking obvious that these guys have to go over, that Barrett needs to clean pin Cena clean. One, two, three, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And that doesn't happen. That, ladies and gentlemen, was the moment in time that the Nexus died. While they stayed as a group. And later on down the road, you remember, oh, the new Nexus was CF Punk. Who do you have Mason Ryan with them and McGilla Crappy with them? A good lord. Oh, my God. If you're wondering if it still irritates me a little bit to this day, hell yeah, it does. Because how different of, could the dynamics of the company potentially be and have been over the past decade, if you didn't have Cena ruin everything. And that's exactly what it was. Cena ruined everything, and Vince allowed Cena to ruin everything because Vince was so too busy cucking for Cena that nothing else freaking mattered to him. And now here we sit, Vince, you stupid idiot, all these years later, and all that cucking for Cena got you what exactly? Now Cena ain't there, and that whole next generation that Cena should have helped build to actually establish himself as a true great, which he's not. You did the Breakfast Club business crap, and now nobody cares about the vast majority of the talent that you have on your roster. And the occasional times that they do, it has to be guys that you bring in from other territories that already have long-established, pre-established freaking fan bases. And even like Daniel Bryan, you know, eventually, he's the guy that became the main event out of all this. The guy that looked the most out of place going back in 2010. The guy that you had the least confidence in could be a main inventor. And not because of all of his ROH or New Japan work. And da, 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 da. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about from the standpoint and perspective of how a guy like Vince and how a company like WWE would view a guy like Daniel Bryan. It's all these years later. He's the one that came became by far the biggest star. Like the whole thing was just screwed up. And it still irritates me to this day. 
that so many guys at that moment in time were ruined. They were just flat ruined. Because of the stupidity of one chairman of the board and the greed and selfishness of one top guy. That's what it comes down to, plain and simple. Sure, there will be some that don't remember all the details of what truly went down a decade ago or kind of remember a decade ago with a little bit more rose-colored glasses that are going to sit there and debate this with me. That, there, there is really not much of a debate here. Like when it mattered and when it was right, the WWE and especially Cena, and especially when it involved Cena, made the wrong decisions time after time after time. And it became quickly obvious after SummerSlam that all the Nexus angle was was something to tie up Cena for a few months, to make Cena look good, to pump up and prop up Cena because you wanted to play it safe because of Linda's Senate campaign instead of doing real actual business and real actual business that could have had one, two, five, ten years of impact in a positive way on your company. You're now at a point now where Wade Barrett ain't there. Skip Sheffield ain't there. He Slater ain't there. Justin Gabriel ain't been there for a long time. What the hell is Otungi even doing anymore? I don't even know. Legitimately, does it really matter? Daniel Bryan's there, but kind of, sort of. You know what I mean? Like, I, I look at what could have been. Tarver's long since been gone. And these guys could have been something. And we should have gotten a couple of main eventers out of it. Like, even if you went at the end of the day and you said, hey, out of this original eight-man faction, you had Skip Sheffield become Ryback, and he would have been a main event guy. A lot of you would vomit in your mouth thinking about it, but it's something to appease Vince. Then you would have had Daniel Bryan be a main event guy, which makes some other fans vomit in their mouth. But, you know, again, compromise here. Wayne Barrett kind of being the compromise of the two. He's got good size, but he can actually talk like... Da, 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 da. Like, absolute worst case scenario. This company should have come, and, come out of this Nexus angle with three main eventers that are still drawing money for the company today. Instead, they got one who doesn't draw that much money for the company today. I'm not trying to slight Daniel Bryan. It's just the reality of who the hell is drawing money for this company anymore anyways. It's so irritating. Because I was absolutely floored. Like, I, I had no trust of Cena. I knew his deal. I knew the level of selfishness that he had. The lack of simple self-awareness for the business that he had in the moment in time that he was in. Like, I always knew it was possible heading into that SummerSlam that year that this was the type of crap that you were going to see. But even going back then, I thought to myself, there's no way he could be this dense, this fucking stupid. There is absolutely no way that he could be this unaware of just how important this moment in time is. And that at the end of the day, he has to get pinned by Wade Barrett clean in the middle of the ring. One, two, three. Man, was I wrong. So when you wonder why people like me and my age bracket, the longtime fans, hate Cena so much and what the character represents and frankly some of the business dealings of the man. It's moments like this right here. That's why. Because even though it was just one story, one big screw up with a company with a long history of screw ups even over the past 10 years. This wasn't just any screw up. This was a screw up that had significant, far reaching, long term, consequential impacts that the company has never recovered from. SummerSlam 2010 will always be remembered for one thing and one thing alone, and I'm not the only one. It will always, always be remembered as the night the Nexus died. <laughs> to you, Cena. Because for making sure that happened, you deserve it.